received a whole series of questions. I've tried to group them into um, five or six topics. Um, I'm doing leading the session. I just volunteered to lead it. I've recently joined the committee. Um, so uh, welcome to you all. Um, the format is we I'll read out a topic area and ask hopefully the person but a person who suggested it just to talk a bit about why they've why they've um, stated it and what their thoughts are if you then want to add to that topic if you could just maybe if you could just um say on the chat so we know you want to say something um, just to avoid us all talking over each other um and so that, that's how we um, i think we, we we've got plenty of topics to cover the whole, to cover the hour so the first uh, a common topic has been uh, around teams, how we've rolled it out of, in a very quick fashion to professional staff and to learning staff. And one point there was that learning staff often didn't have the, the training to use teams, weren't familiar with it. And that was certainly the case at Goldsmiths. So if anybody would like to start, talk, start talking about their experiences of teams for professional staff and uh, learning. We'd like to start on that. OK, so at, at King's, we've been um, starting to use Teams for some time now, um, but we've not been driving the rollout. We've been allowing people to adopt as they go along. Uh, it seems to be a fairly common way of doing it in, in higher education. It's how we managed to get um, from where we are in terms of um, Skype for Business. Uh, what we did there was we just literally made it available to people and then it gradually built around us. And we've been doing this for since the late part, latter part of 2012. So Skype for Business is quite well embedded. Um, our biggest challenge with Teams is people not wanting to move to Teams versus Skype business, and that does lead us to some challenges. And the other challenge we have is that we have some telephony that's coming out of Skype for business, and that means that if you want to make telephone calls, you have to be in Skype for business. But if you want to talk to people over the network, you have to use Teams. What we have noticed is that use of Teams takes a bit of familiarity, so you need to get into Teams and work with it, and then people seem to find it easier over time. So initially there's a, a reaction to it as being quite difficult to use, but it kind of grows on people. So we, we've seen quite a reasonable uptake, and, and indeed our, so we don't allow people to create their own Teams, they're created for them by IT, and we are currently besieged with the number of teams that people want us to create, which is, is giving us significant back end problems. OK, thank you for that, Trevor. So, so just to, just trying to add, it's Mehmet, Mehmet here from Greenwich. So um, what we also have been slowly working on on teams um, for the past past year or two. Um, we've had a lot of um, a lot of foundational work to do around Office 365 before we got round to Teams, but fortunately, by the time um, this all kicked off and the, the possibility of remote working, Teams was a, was in a position where um, it was actually safe to roll out to staff. Uh, we haven't rolled out to students, um, but just com comparing it to, to, to Trevor's comments, obviously we we are allowing people to staff to create their own Teams. We don't. We are not doing that centrally. Um, that we may be the minority there, um, but we've we we hope we've designed teams in a way that it watches its own face. Um, uh, you know, team te teams get uh, cap cut, get cancelled off if they're not if they're inactive for a certain amount of period. Um, naming and back end stuff is all is all designed properly. So, um, so we've now rolled teams out to all of our staff. Um, who are using it for uh, communication, telephone calls, video conferences, meetings, and whatnot. Um, and it's working well at the moment. Could I ask a question on the end of um, what Mehmet's just uh, suggested in relation to the others? Um, are you um, allowing your individuals to create teams, or are your IT creating uh, the teams for members? Uh, it's Jason from University of Greenwich okay. as well. Thank you, Jason. 
So definitely kings, we, we create four people. Okay, so, um, so, so that's created a lot of um, a lot of work for, for, for you, I take it, Trevor? It is, yes, and, and it is it does give us quite a lot of challenge in, in that particular team. Um, and there is quite a bit of information that is required before people get a team. And, and I won't um, stand here and say whether I think that's the right way to do it or the wrong way, but it, it, it does work. And, and unfortunately for us, we are planning to automate it, but haven't been able to get that system in place at this point. But the challenge for us, the reason we do it is to make sure that naming is appropriate, make sure that we don't end up with um, lots of teams that get abandoned very rapidly or teams with inappropriate content that aren't actually being owned mm. properly. So mm. that, that's the reason behind it. Mm. I, I, I have a question. Is How have um, institutions managed demand from academics for teams? Because at Goldsmiths, it is just for staff. And we've actually ended this. Is, sorry, Julian here, the moderator. We, we, we've gone from only being by rec only being by request through myself or BRM actually to now allowing staff to request. But we're now getting. We know academics are starting to see it and wanting to use it, and sometimes wanting to use it for teaching purposes, which is actually the area of another department within Goldsmiths. So, have any institutions have any of you had issues with that? Yeah, hi, Julian. Darren, yep. Darren, Darren here from Regents. Yeah, it's a, it's a moot point, really. Uh, we literally rolled out Teams to staff uh, uh, a week before the COVID-19 situation. So staff had a week to play with it, and then they were all sent home to work from home. So we, we weren't quite as, as far ahead as um, certainly Kings. Now they've all got this new toy to play with. Um, we're getting a lot of academics saying, look, can we use this with our students, please? And like you, Julian, uh, our learning tech department is, is managed by another team. And uh, the learning tech people are basically saying, no, we don't want students to use Teams. We've got our own, um, our own collaboration tool within, um, within the VLE environment. And we don't want to confuse students um, by using something else. But at the same time, our students are saying, why have we got to use this VLE tool when actually we'd much prefer to use Teams? So... Uh, the way we've handled that at the moment is to say, well, it's only literally in the first week of online teaching. Let's let things settle down and then hopefully um, our academic community will come around to the idea of rolling out teams with students. But I'll certainly be interested to hear what other people are doing with their, with their student uh, community and academic community. OK, thank you for that. Um, um, we've got John, John from one Morley one College. Comment. OK, please go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, John from Morley College. Um, I mean, we, we've um, had no experience of any online teaching at all. So um, we had just started using Teams really just for meetings um, as part of our merger, just so we could uh, have some um, re um, uh, remote uh, meetings um, across our three centres. Um, but it gave us the opportunity, obviously, in the current situation, just to try and roll something out very quickly. Um, still uh, very early days to understand how well that's gone, but uh, in certainly we are we, we created those teams um, from the MIS data so for all of our current courses, so that the uh, tutors and the students um, are members of those teams. And you know, we're starting to see some some good uh, examples of how that is being used. And uh, I think because we haven't had a history of um, online learning in the past, we, we haven't got that kind of issue of competition. Um, with uh, Zoom and Google Classrooms and other other sort of um, uh, environments. So from that perspective, it's, it's quite clear in terms of um, there's only one option that our staff and students have got uh, and we feel we can support it. What we don't know yet is how effectively they're going to be using it. Thank you for that, John. There's just a question from Trevor asking if anybody's actually integrated uh, Teams with uh, their VLE yet. Hi, it's Dominic from City here. Um, okay. Hi, I haven't got precise details on this, but I believe we are actually no entirely wrong. It's between <laughs> student records and <laughs> yeah. uh, teams, isn't it? Sorry, ignore it's me. Right. Back on uh, mute. Um, we've got several other questions. I'm going to move on now, but I think from this, the the experience of teams seems to have been quite positive based on what we've heard and what's been said. Um, 
and nobody seems to have been overwhelmed by it yet. I think I know the goldsmiths and several of you seem to feel the same thing. This has actually led to, is obviously leading the way for teams to be used for teaching in the future. Um, I'm going to have a total change of tack now. We had a question about mental well-being and how we are supporting our, our staff working from home and during this period, how we're supporting their mental well-being. Would anybody like to just um, talk about how they've considered about that and what they're doing? Um, yeah, OK, I think I think I may have put this question forward. So I'll, Good, I'll just... I hope you stand up because you all come in as anonymous. <laughs> Hello? Yeah, please go ahead. Oh, sorry, sorry. I'm um, sorry, Mehmet here. So, so I mean, working from home is, is obviously very different to being being at your university and being on premise. And while um, some people may be very used to working from home, um, I think the entire workforce working from home is, is very different. Um, and also people have been put into situations um, whereby they are at home with their, their children um, and, and wife and they're around all the time. Uh, and it's and, and, and a lot of people, um, you know, being being candid, go to work to to escape, to have a, to have a break to some degree uh, and manage their life around that. So I think that it's it's being very it's being taken very seriously at Greenwich. Um, we're really thinking about what we can do uh, to ensure that people people's mental and physical well-being is is considered and 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 we're thinking up ways ways we can do that we're ensuring that we're video calling people um we're being very flexible around when people need to be logged in and when people need to be working um you know we have to appreciate that there's there lots of lots of people have got other other things at home going on uh some people are ill um, you know, we're we're thinking about how to how to put some fun into it, uh, do a bit of socialising. I think Darren was saying earlier that you know with the with his other friends had a, a virtual drink or, or whatnot. So so things like that, um, maybe quizzes. Um, so yeah, so it's just we haven't rolled anything out yet, but th those are just some ideas of of um, of trying to just consider people's health in this situation. Where where that where people are either self isolating or at home a lot of the time and, and potentially will be for um, the next month or month and a half at least. Anybody else have thoughts? Uh, I don't want to uh, probably uh, contribute uh, from Greenwich again, but um, in one of the team meetings uh, yesterday, um, uh, one of the initiatives were. Um, because obviously the isolation um, from a garden point of view, I think staff were putting forward challenges uh, in relation to what they were growing in their garden. So, you know, just in terms of that kind of, um, the, the theme was on uh, well-being, but the, the theme was to obviously alleviate the isolation. Um, so, yeah, I guess uh, I'll be keen to probably hear what, what, what others are doing in relation to this topic, yeah. So around that, would it help to have some kind of little, you know, page up or sh little tips and tips and tricks for this that we could actually circulate around? Well, in a sense, in a sense, uh, Julian, there's already quite a wide source, whether it's your size, uh, okay, yeah, uh, whether it's GISC, and it might be, you know, it might be yeah. we need to just signpost people to to the right places. Um, I'd also thinking it's, there's quite a lot of people on this call we, and we're hearing very few voices. So uh, it might just be useful, Julian, if we can just explain to people how they can contribute because not, not everyone's willing to, uh, to, to jump in as easily. And there's also quite a few comments on the, on the chat, I've noticed. And I'm not, I'm not sure if everyone is looking at the chat as, as we're going through this call. Yeah, I'm, yeah, the chat is, I'm looking at the chat. I think a lot of those have been responses to some of the, the points sure. that have been raised. But if you want, yes, if there's something you want to um, state, if you actually just put a chat, if just say, I'd like, I have a question in the chat um, box, then I'll, I'll bring you in. Thanks, Julian. Julian, there was a question that flew past um, about low, uh, low bandwidth. Um, and whether there was a way of uh, dealing with it in Teams video to degrade just to audio on the live stream. I think that, that was Andy Coulthard. 
OK, yeah, we discussed that at the beginning, whether we should all, whether we, was that for this meeting or in general, Marilyn? I Sorry. thought it was in general. Yeah, because we were wondering whether video would degrade. Does anybody have any um, experience or um, an answers for how we can actually improve the quality of teams with low bandwidth? Ah, oh, yeah, Philip, you just, yeah, Philip, do you want to come in? I'm, uh, I don't know if you can hear properly. Yep, I can hear. Uh, I'm a particular victim of low broadband. Uh, so what you can do in more actions is is you can actually turn off so the three dots in the in the bar and you can turn off incoming video. So even if someone is showing video, we can actually turn it off. Um, and sometimes that does help. We've been using video to uh, as a hand up, so just the person talking or who wants to talk starts to show their video to say, oh, I want to I want to speak. And we found just one person showing wow. the video at a time is a good way to manage bandwidth as well. That's a good point. Does anybody, any other comments on that? Um, no other comments, but there was there was a, a an email for, on the um, USADA directors list from 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 someone uh, I forget his name or what institution was from, but it was just some guidance for people at home around how to manage uh, or, or how to reduce bandwidth, which which I think was really really helpful. Um, and I'm happy to try and circulate some of that information if I can dig it out. Okay. Yeah. Um, on your wider point, Mehmet, about well-being at home, I'm sure you know our learning and development departments in our various colleges and universities have sent some guidance out. You know anything from exercising to you know taking time out and so forth. But um, you know if anyone is struggling for resources to send out to staff um, or students for that matter, then you know I'm, I'm more than happy to sign, signpost some of that. So it's one of the things that, that we've done at King's to try and help with some of this is we've set up in everybody's diary for the whole of IT um, a, an all day meeting, which is just set there so people can join it at any time they like. So okay. you can go into the meeting at the start of the day or you know, when you're having a coffee or something. And the rule is if there's people in there, you can go in and just chat. If there are, if you're the first person there, start the meeting up and wait for people to come in. And we're getting sort of random groups of people dropping into the meeting, having a, a chat about times and then disappearing off back to work again. Trying to rebuild some of that sort of contact that you might have had if you want to get a cup of coffee or a drink of water or something. So that seems to be working quite well for us. So it's something that people could try if they're uh, so minded. Yes, I think Graham's got a point. Um, uh, Graham Button from Just, I think. Yeah, hi. Um, hello, everybody. Let me see if I can just put my camera on as well. I didn't realise you were going to share it now. Apologies. Yes, go ahead. Oh, okay. Now, do you want me to back, back out for a minute? No, no, go. Go. <laughs> go. Okay. So um, I'm a mental health first aider at JISC. And, you know, we meet together on a regular basis and just with regards to us all working from home now, you know, there's been a meeting called, we were actually in it yesterday, just to start to say, you know, what support do we need to make sure, you know, that we're providing the business? And I think we're pretty well advanced in that already. But if I can just bring out a couple of topics that, uh, you know, that, that we're actively working on at this moment in time. So a, a blog to cover how to look after children when working from home. So, you know, if you've got people that are doing it and doing it successfully, get them to contribute so they can just share it with your communities. Um, reminders about um, well work, about well-being whilst you're working from home. So, you know, I think one of the things that we discussed is if people aren't necessarily used to working from home is that they can feel tied to their desk. So there's apps available where you might just want to, you know, set a, a 45 or a 30 minute app to say, take a break, you know, just get away from your desk. And, uh, and 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 just take some fresh air. I think, and, and please question me on any of these. I mean, it's it, it, it's early stages for us, but um, just staying connected, you know, with the the people that you work with in the office. So just creating spaces where you meet socially. You know, if you're used to sitting back to back on a chair with these people on a daily basis, and you're being taken away from those. You just want to consider, you know, making sure that they've got a space that they can meet, you know, maybe 15 minutes a day and talk about things other than work. 
So I, I think right, I've, I've, I've waffled on a little bit. Let me just drop a note after this meeting with just a couple of key points that we're focusing on within just at this moment in time from a mental health first aiders point of view. Oh, thank you for that, Graham. It makes you realise that people don't go to work just for the money. There are other reasons we go to the workplace. Yeah. Did anybody have anything else to add? No. Okay. 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 Uh, next topic I just want to cover is we've had so there are several questions around remote access, and of course to allow remote access, you need to ensure that you've got the, you've got good remote access. Um, Philip, would you like to just talk very briefly about what we had to do in Goldsmiths to ensure the VPN, the quality of the VPN, the capacity? Um, I think there's varying different organisations will have different VPN setups. Ours was very small, related for a very small group of people. Um, and what we've done is we're moving on to uh, our auto firewalls and we're launching Global Protect, which will give us significantly more connectivity. Um, I think it is a, a particular challenge and a lot of what we're looking at is how to look at how people are actually working because sometimes VPN isn't the right solution for them. So we're also looking at our Citrix estate in terms of large applications people with slow broadband, sometimes those connectivities don't work very well. So uh, Citrix or virtual desktop is a better way to go. So really, you know, having enough capacity on your VPN is, is also knowing what it's being used for. And that's something that you need to consider each use case. OK, Philip, I'm going to stop you there just because the quality is very poor. Some of it sounds like electro, electro funk music, um, but thank you for that. Um, did anybody else want to talk about, mention the measures they've taken to improve or gar um, guarantee the VPN access, remote access? Um, uh, I can, if it helps, Julian. Um, I'm not technical remotely, so I can just say what we've done regarding Citrix. Um, up to a week before uh, the COVID-19 situation, we only had 100 Citrix licenses for, I mean, we're not particularly big uh, university, but uh, I mean, we would only normally have around 30 people use it overnight, but suddenly we had to change that. It took a lot of uh, work to get Citrix to um, increase our licenses for us. Uh, we weren't prepared to go down the route of um, um, going with Microsoft yet, although that is certainly a medium term strategy. So, so, so I suppose it's a bit of a moan with Citrix, really. They were pretty inflexible really they wanted to charge us the normal going rate and to uh, we've got, and we got some support from you size as well to help reduce that cost by half but we're still having to pay 50 percent of a normal charge for an extra 300 citrix licenses which we got on we because we went up to 99 um the day before we applied the extra 300 licenses so we got there just in time I can probably say something on this, but I'm conscious I'm I'm probably doing a lot of talking here. Yeah, I was thinking the same. I don't know if anyone else wants to. Oh yeah. Um. Hopefully, I've, I'm muted myself. Okay. Um. It's Gerald from uh, Haven Colleges. Yeah. Uh, um. For ourselves, we were using primarily um, remote desktop services for our remote access. Um. So we just kind of doubled the capacity on that about a week ago. And that seems to be getting a lot of use from staff. Seems to be going pretty well to be fair um, and then we've got a couple over I think someone else mentioned global protect but we've only done that for particular uh, kind of high value staff that had specific apps on their machines in the office so we've got a few of them actually just running um, we've kind of resumed from power loss on permanently so a few that are actually accessing their desktops and the rest pretty much all over a mixture of RDS and office 365 and I think one thing we did find that was helpful, and I guess probably it's nothing unusual for what you've done yourselves, was that um, preemptively before the staff went, we did a uh, remote working guidance and basically did it as scenario based. So I kind of went through common apps or scenarios that staff are using. So even from stuff like Office 365 shared mailboxes that normally are, are nothing normally in Outlook, but obviously working from the web, a little bit different. 
and that went out and that's on the staff intranet and again i think we've found just from the help desk calls we've been able to kind of snippet bits of that guide i guess just reduce the number of calls that we've had coming in for kind of common scenarios and then some of that guidance from Tomo on the uh, on the group as well that's gone in there as well so that was a really good post and uh, appreciate him making that one so that's in, that's so you put the information on the internet so you the scenarios were to help you actually work out the issues or you actually put the scenarios there for people to work through um for staff yeah so literally we're kind of like i want to mark my registers on the mis system for example so that one they have to go through remote desktop for um i want to access my shared mailboxes again just a simple OA guide but it's just trying to preempt those questions for staff before they get there sure. at home and how do i do xyz that i know how to do on my desktop but i don't understand how to do it kind of working from home and again particularly for getting connected to the um the remote desktop and with a bit of guidance about GDPR in there as well. So I'm just trying to make sure they transfer as little data or no data uh, as possible to their own devices and just kind of work through virtual desktop screens for the most part. I think that's um, that's a really good thing to do. So so we've done something similar at Greenwich whereby we've we've created some some flow diagrams, if you like, of of uh, you know if you need access to this do this and do that and actually one of the main reasons we did that was to try and try and encourage people to not use our virtual desktop or VPN service if they don't have to because a lot of a lot of our users don't understand that something is externally accessible for example our student and staff portal our exchange email via, via OWA and lots of other services are accessible without actually having to come in to a remote a remote service um, and that was really important in trying to ensure that we don't use up our licenses um, we we at Greenwich have got two ways of getting into our in, our in, in internal services one is VPN and one is uh, our virtual desktop which is VMware horizon um, view and VPN is is um is is a bit unknown we don't advertise the vpn as much um because there's a there's a bit more there's a lot of manual work and overhead in in setting up people for vpn um so we only allow vpn for specialist people who who need it who maybe don't have good internet connections or who have unmanaged devices um that uh, that obviously we don't know what's on it our vpn does compliance posturing so from a security perspective um, it means we can we can get them plugged in if their laptop laptop or device is safe and then they can remote desktop uh, and for everyone else um, we have our virtual desktop which is uh, which gives that people access to their shared areas and things like that and other internal only services um, and we've had to bolster infrastructure we've had to bolster licenses um, as 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 um, Darren was mentioning so so yeah we had to do all that as well um and there was there was no worry about cost at the time it was just important about just just making sure that that service is there and it's available so so we upped our licenses quite significantly around that time and and because it's all on premise we had to scale out infrastructure as well did get me thinking about trying to move out to the cloud one day so sorry ranted on a bit there but that's that's our position at greenwich so one quick question for the group i don't know i've come in a little bit late um so i've already missed it how are you all handling so this? Who, who's speaking I'm sorry, it's Gerard from um, New City College Group. Right, yeah. um, so how are you handling telephony or how has telephony been for yourselves? Because um, we did have Mitel border gateway many, many moons ago. In theory, would let people take phones home with them, but that kind of has gone by the wayside a bit. So we had to redirect lock calls out to mobiles, which is less than ideal. But I'm um, just wondering how, how you're all handling that side of things. We'd like to come in on that. I know at Goldsmiths we haven't actually um, advertised this too much because we realise there are going to be costs, um, un unexpected costs from forwarding. So we've actually, we are going to put some information up, but more about accessing voice boxes. And so we've actually left the call forwarding. Does anyone want to come in? Um, Andy, do you want to say something? Sure, yeah. Hi, this is uh, Andy Coulthard. Um, 
Yeah. But I work around a number of other offices as well, but um, we're using Jabber using a VPN to give the office phones out. They got rid of all of the sort of fixed phone lines. But I must say we've had some issues with the VPN with things like split tunneling and various sort of unstable configurations. It seems to work for a couple of hours and then for some reason some things work, some things don't. So people believe that there are some issues with either routing or web filtering, but there's something going on. And, and I think that as we've just suddenly pushed all the staff out, something that might have happened once a month is now happening every couple of hours. But I think that maybe we'll find that with other things that we're using, that we've had some things that might have been an annoyance and suddenly they're being relied on a lot more. So I'm, I'm curious if anybody else has had any sort of issues with degrading of services as well. No, I mean we've we've hit we've hit some, some interesting uh, bugs and problems as as load increases on services that have never experienced that type of load, as Microsoft has done with Teams and whatnot. Um, we, we are actually using teams now for a lot of internal calls um, which which is which is great um, we have IP phones at work um, there is there is uh, there is call forwarding options there are there is a there is a mobile app where you can redirect your work phone to your mobile and it hide your hide your phone some people are using that and some people aren't just depends on how important external calls are for for you. I was uh, just going to uh, add um, on on one particular um, user, on one particular group of users. We, we've had to say to the user that the service is going to be of um, quite a poor quality. Um, I, I could probably go in and, and give a little bit of background. It does touch on VPN. Um, I think a question earlier was asked around VPN for, for Greenwich and the uh, 40 gate um, may actually answer um, the question that streamed past. But in, in the particular incident that I'm referring to, we had to say to the user, or it was a, an academic and he's probably um, dealing with about 30 students, um, that the experience is going to be poor the way in which this particular specialism was, was set up, had been set up. Um, and if time permits, I'd, I'd happily go into a little bit more detail as to as to why. But just that initial, um, it was not a service level agreement, but just that initial um, expectation uh, in relation to um, what what the students, I guess, would be in the end user would would expect. Um, we we were really actually dumbing down and saying that the service is actually going to be um, quite a, a low level service in relation to this instance. Yeah, I, I could, I'd, I'd happily go into, if time permits, um, uh, that case, that use case as to what we actually did. But um, setting the expectation level was uh, pretty much the uh, the summary or point I was uh, able to make. Okay, thank you for that, Jason. Yeah, I think there probably won't be time now, but I'm sure people can. Uh, would, you, would you be happy for people to follow up with you outside yeah. this call? Okay. Um, one of the, there are some questions when we were talking about um, VPN and um, VPN access. So, are questions about security, um, how we're balancing, and obviously we need this question of how we're balancing security with people now using more home devices, uh, endpoint security. So, would somebody um, like to um, give, start off giving their experience? Maybe yourself, Marin, was this thing you were interested in or that you actually wanted to talk about, talk about your own experience? Uh, I think it was actually Mehmet who mentioned it when we were talking this morning about Zoom. The fact that there is obviously um, quite a push to get people to be able to function. And does that go along with not doing sufficient due diligence over the products being used and being requested? Um, Mehmet, do you want to add to that? Um Yes, yeah, certainly. So, I mean, I, I was mentioning that um, a bit earlier that obviously at, at Greenwich, um, we're, we've spent a lot of time trying to get our Office 365 uh, services up and running and specifically Teams. And we've spent a lot of time in, in committees agreeing on policy around this and information security and whatnot. And obviously in the end made decision to roll it out to all staff. Um, and that, another thing I mentioned earlier was around device security was that 
Um, we, I mean, we, we, this is, you know, this is quite, we've put a lot of work into this fairly recently, so it's a bit of a success story, but obviously we're, the, our virtual desktop services, um, uh, you know, a, a virtual, virtual environment that, that staff, the staff and students are connecting on it is a safe environment. It's a, it's a, it's an isolated window, uh, basically streaming a, a Windows desktop and uh, copy and paste functionality, for example, is even disabled. So there's no way to get anything from the local device on. And same with VPN, we had old VPN services that just allowed you to connect through that didn't do any compliance checking. Um, we ne we've, we've disabled all those. We have our, as Jason mentioned, our 40 gate VPN service, which does check your local device for antivirus and when make sure everything's uh, up to date in terms of Windows updates or, or Linux or whatnot. Um, and, and that means that it won't, it won't allow a connection unless it's safe. That's, Sorry, someone say something. So, Mimi, is that a specific pro product from Fortinet? Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, it's. Uh, I don't. I don't know what the. Yeah, it's a Fortigate VPN. We also have Palo Alto, and I think someone mentioned Global Protect earlier as well. Um, we also did. We also, we also have Palo Alto firewalls on on our edge. Those have um vpn we're licensed to use the vpn but those we don't we're not licensed for the compliance part of it posturing um so we haven't we haven't rolled that out to anyone that's our backup for for system staff um but yeah for on the on the 40 gates we we've we've licensed vpn and we've licensed compliance checking there are sorry it's david sharon from london business school um yeah the, the 48 vpn supports a, a a web session which is effectively a remote desktop provided by the well quite but um that you can consume in the browser but if you download the 40 gate client um that provides you a, a full classic vpn um and as part of that the, the client uh, can do some form of posture assessment now I'm told by um, our network guys who implement this that there are it, it's fun getting that to work in a way that um, gives you something useful and yet doesn't lock large numbers of people out. But yes, that's that capability exists in the um, the, the 48 VPN client, which comes as part of part of that solution. Adam. Yeah, yeah, that's that's pretty that's pretty much my, our take on it as well. It's it's a bit of a balancing act getting that getting that yeah. testing, uh, correct and, and right but we, we've been we've been slowly doing that for the past six months so we we've got to a point now where if, if people are having problems it's probably because they haven't updated something um but yeah so from I a mean, security perspective it's it would be uh, it's important uh, it would be interesting perhaps to um to, to um swap ideas on where you got to with that perhaps offline afterwards or yeah absolutely yeah thank you good afternoon um um, Thierry Delet from the University of Westminster. Um, I mean, with the VPN, uh, were you routing the, the traffic uh, by default, all of the traffic uh, to the um, through the VPN, and that includes, for example, Netflix and what staff might um, do video uh, streaming, or have you actually changed the, the policy to do VPN split tunneling, and what security yeah. aspects have you considered? Yeah, so um, so quite right. So we 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 are doing split tunneling um, with this. So only Greenwich traffic will go through the, the the VPN. All other services will go out through people's domestic broadband. And were you doing that? I mean, uh, before or did you change it as a result? No, 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 that was by by design. That was all done in in the design okay. phase before all, all of this. So, so at, as I mentioned, we we've been really fortunate with the timing that we we've spent a lot of time on remote services um, o over the past. Um, uh, actually, in light of some of the recent breaches that happened in the sector um, uh, about six six seven months ago. So, so yeah, we we spent a lot of time on that, and, and which was which was fortunate for us. Can I just change the focus a bit? Because one there was another question that came in was how how we were people were allowing students access to uh, applications and services that they couldn't now couldn't access because they're off site. Does anybody want to? Does anybody have any experience of that about enabling new access for students for this special period?
I, I've got one. Um, Go ahead, Jason. Uh, what, one thing we, we've done um, uh, with with the students is initially collate a lot more um, uh, from a from a web page point of view of, of the free um, tools that are available and. A lot of the suppliers that um, the software vendors, particularly in light of what's what's recently taken place, a lot of them have, have come about and said, you know, we're offering um, some free trials uh, for, for for particular periods. So I guess the teams now uh, are tasked with collating that information and, and, and making it available to the students. Um, such that they can either go to these web pages and download this and install it on their home devices. Um, just as of this morning, we've had um, one student say that the device is broken and obviously, you know, the, um, the, the admin around getting devices to students uh, whilst they're working remotely is, is, is a totally different topic. But we, we did have um, a particular topic where we've got a games lab at Greenwich and um, specifically installed on on the, the local PCs, uh, uh, software like, software packages like 3D Studio Max, Maya, Unity, Unreal. So they, they, these particular packages are not going to work in a in a remote environment because they're so processor intensive, they're so you know either graphics card intensive. So to try and do anything like that in a in a remote capacity, um, it, it just it would just render the resource. Uh, um, useful in, a, in an environment where we're struggling in terms of bandwidth uh, uh, that was mentioned already. So just to probably um, briefly scratch on and to put this in context, this came about while in a very short period of time while everyone shifted off site. Um, so some of the security concerns that were mentioned um, earlier uh, were quite quickly reviewed and uh, 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 the VPN and then uh, the remote desktop um, were a couple of the areas that we used in conjunction to allow this particular group of students to first of all connect in and then uh, tunnel to the actual local machine um, to actually get access to um, some of the software that's, that's been mentioned specifically in relation to um, those those key uh, those key packages and that that I have to understand you have to understand that packages that are not available off-site or um, within within the free downloads um, that some of the vendors have uh, quite quickly uh, said we're now going to make uh, available uh, to 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 students in an off-site capacity. So it's Thank early days yet. It's yeah. it's very early days yet because um, for for that particular case, we did need to say look, um, there's going to be. Uh, uh, not the usual experience. A lot of the time we kind of pride ourselves, hence that lab, on, on giving the students a, a really high performance um, experience. But just uh, the byproduct of the off, uh, of, of allowing something like this was to say, look, you can still continue. You can still continue in an offsite capacity. Um, and it was, it was weighing up whether we, uh, for that entire group, say, look, it's going to be extenuating circumstances that uh, you're not going to be able to continue. Whereas I guess, this group was able to continue. Um, I guess we're going to need to probably get some feedback on what the experience is. They're still uh, submitting, they're still going through uh, in relation to that particular coursework. Thank you, Jason. I think, of course, the main thing we've had to do is to probably the same with, with most of you rush around to get the temporary licenses for Adobe Creative Cloud. Does anybody have anything else to, before we move on to another, maybe a final topic? Does anybody have anything else to add about granting access to um, special access to students? OK. Um, ben just asked a question about whether this current, uh, Ben Henderson was wondering whether with this current situation, it's prompted any of you to consider new services that you need, you need to um, purchase. And deploy. Uh, good afternoon. Yeah, I'm Thierry uh, Delet from University of Westminster. I mean, one of the challenge that we have is we've got a lot of students from China, mm -hmm. and some of those students, I mean, who, for example, used to be on site, I mean, might have gone back to to China. And the, the problem is from China. I mean, we use Blackboard as the VLE. 
and it's a bit um, um, hit and miss. I mean, for students when they they connect, I mean, to our cloud Blackboard VLE. So we are considering maybe to to have a locally deployed uh, Blackboard in China, and that creates all sorts of um, that raises all sorts of questions. Because currently, yeah, it's a bit tricky for the students who might have come back to China to to stay in touch with us. So I'm wondering whether, yeah, what other institutions might be doing for students in China or overseas who might have come back there for the online teaching and. So you're talking about provision for you need special provision for particularly the Asian students who will be working from home for a long period. Yeah. Well, maybe related to this, um, there was also a question. I think we, we, we've, we've forgotten this researchers and how we're having to cater for researchers. And I've had some researchers who wanted to know where their the machines they ordered were and how they were going to get them delivered, which is a kind of uh, a service desk BAU um, question. But does anybody have any comments about how they are supporting or, how, or any particular issues they have with supporting researchers? Was that somebody trying to come in? I was wondering if anyone was sort of particularly struggling with this is Anna Matthews here from USIZA. Um, anyone struggling with, um, you know, if you've got clusters and um, sort of HTP, that kind of thing, if you've got um, researchers struggling to, to get into those and use those? Um, I mean, where, where at Greenwich, where possible, um, we have some researchers are taking their machines home. Uh, some of them have just got, uh, you know, big beastie m machines, which you know, you need, need uh, you know, quite a musty person or two people to carry to the car, but that works. When it comes to clusters and whatnot, that's just not possible, and they're going to have, they're having to go through VPN and remote desktop. OK, well, I'll take that silence as a prompt. Was there anything else anybody wanted to raise? Anything that we um, that we've missed? How are you? Um, how are people doing? I mean, with uh, new starters joining their. <laughs> 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 well, in Goldsmiths, we're going to look at that. I think we're, we're going to have to start looking at that. Um, so Julian here again, I, I started to put a question list together last week of all the things that occurred to me, and one of them was yeah, how do we get laptop, how do we get machines to new starters or take them back from old people have left? I think we're 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 still working that through after the last week's rush. Okay, yeah, wait till you find out how much equipment has gone home that you didn't know about. We've we've <laughs> well, we were trying to get we did ask people to note it down, and we think mm -hmm. we think we were told, but then we had a theft, and we had to work out was it a theft or yeah, was it somebody yeah. just taking equipment home? It will find I out. Know some months time so um, I'm, I'm not sure if it's a good thing or a bad thing but because um, our, our staff t tend to like to have um, help desk help them a lot with things all of the laptops that came out of the woodwork uh, we, we got visibility of as they all suddenly appeared in the help desk <laughs> to have patches and things installed on them so <laughs> we got some good visibility there but to the earlier question um, I believe at the moment we're undergoing a a hiring freeze, not for any other reason other than the the, the sheer administrative difficulty of, of dealing with some of these issues. So, um, uh, yeah, I think that's how we're, we're, we're dealing with that at the moment. And then we'll, I think, depending on how long this goes on for and, and um, exactly what government advice continues to be or, or or changes into in the in the coming weeks, then that will be reviewed. But yeah, it's a it's an interesting challenge. So yeah, so we're we're three minutes to go. So obviously, 
hopefully you found this this hour useful. We felt it was a good thing to do to get something to actually happen so that we can, can keep our community together. We obviously are relatively unpracticed at this, as is all of you in actually using it. So um, hopefully you found some use out of it. If nothing else, you know that everybody else has the same problems as you. Um, we will be looking to resume our normal kind of um, sessions when everybody's back and, and this thing has gone away. And um, if not, we'll be looking to, to do something more like that, this, but a bit more polished in a, in a little while. So um, hopefully it's been useful. Thank you very much for attending and, and giving it a try and keep safe out there. And Trevor, just to point out, I think we've got several comments, people saying they have found this useful. It's lovely. Good. Excellent. And any feedback that you can give us would be great, you know, because we can then try and improve something if we're doing this for some time. We'll just hope we're not doing this for Christmas. Thank you very much, everybody. Cheers, all. Have a good rest of the afternoon. Thanks, all. Thank you. Thanks.